Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today, inshallah, we will discuss some points and tips on how to score a star in paper 6. So, let's start it. There are four questions in paper 6. The first question is divided into two parts. Usually, the first part will ask you about laboratory tools and equipment, their names and their uses. For example, here we have stop clock for measuring time, balance to measure mass, and of course, thermometer for temperature. We also have mortar and pestle. Mortar and pestle used for grinding. Sometimes you have a very large crystal, you have to grind it to fine powder, or you can grind plant leaves to extract some pigments from them. Of course, the large bowl or the blade is a mortar, and the pestle is a hand that is used for grinding. Spatula, it looks like a spoon. It can transport some solid powder or solid crystals. We also have the dropper that is used to take few drops of a liquid. Like in the titration, we can use it to take few drops of the indicator added in the conical flask before titration. Syringe is used to collect and measure the volume of a gas given off in a chemical reaction. We also have filter funnel, which is used in filtration. Bunsen burner, used for heating. Also, the tripod stand is used for heating. We can place the Bunsen burner below it, then the gauss on the top of it. Now, it looks like a table. We can heat something like evaporating dish on the top of this table. Evaporating dish is used to evaporate a solvent from a solution. Of course, the solid will be left behind here in the evapor evaporating dish. We also have the condenser. The condenser is used to cool and condense hot vapor into a liquid. The liquid will be collected from here. The condenser has two openings. This one, the lower opening, is always for water in, and the upper op opening is always for water out. So this gives complete circulation of cold water that is used to condense the hot vapor. A very important tool is the measuring cylinder. It is used to measure volume. The advantage of the measuring cylinder, it gives a quick and fast measurement, but the disadvantage, it is not accurate. Also, the pipette is used to measure volume. The advantage of the pipette, it is very accurate, but the disadvantage, it, it is quite slow. It takes some time to measure the volume with the pipette. Also, the purette is used to measure volume, but the purette is used mainly in titration. The purette has a scale start here from zero and end here, a 50 centimeter cube. It is very accurate, but it is used mainly in titration. The difference between purette and pipette, that the purette has scale. We can measure volume with decimal, like 20 centimeter, 20.3 centimeter cube, 27.8, 39.5, and so on. But the pipette has no scale. If it measures 25 centimeter cube, it will measure it as one volume, and we can add it all the 25 centimeter cube you can add it once no scale no decimals only one volume so of course the bibet cannot be used in titration this is for the first part of the question the second part will always ask about the techniques so let's start by the separation techniques we have filtration filtration is a separation of insoluble solid from a liquid here on the filter paper we will have the solid, the insoluble solid, which is called residue, and in the beaker we will have the liquid or the solvent, which is called filtrate. Second method is distillation, which is the separation of a solvent from a solution. If you have a solution and you want the solvent, you can use distillation or sample distillation. Here it is called sample distillation because we only have one solvent, so we will obtain it by boiling, then cooling and condense, then we can collect this solvent. The third method is fractional distillation. It is used to separate mixture of miscible liquids, like mixture of alcohol or alcohol with water. This separation depends on the boiling point. The liquid with a lower boiling point will be evaporated faster and collected first. The fourth method, evaporation or crystallization, it is used to separate soluble solid from solution. Like we can see here from the diagram, we will evaporate the solvent because we don't need the solvent, we want the solid. And after evaporation, the solid will be left here behind at 
the bottom of the evaporating dish. Finally, we have chromatography. It is used for separation and identification of sugars, dyes, pigments, and amino acids. So, of course, if you have any one of these substances, you will choose chromatography as the separation technique. Let's see some points about each technique. First, chromatography. The first point here that the baseline has to be drawn with pencil because pencil, unlike ink, it will not dissolve in the solvent and so it will not interfere with the result. But of course, ink will dissolve in the solvent and may give false spots. Second point, the level of the solvent. The level of the solvent should be always below the baseline. Otherwise, the substance or the spot will be washed off or completely dissolved in the solvent and we don't want this to happen. We want the substance or the spot to move along the paper with the solvent and not dissolve in it. So the level of the solvent should always drawn below the baseline. Sometimes we cover the beaker with a lead if we have a volatile solvent to prevent the evaporation of this solvent. If you have a spot that didn't move from the baseline during chromatography, that means this substance is not soluble in the solvent. And to do chromatography, we have to change the solvent for uh, to choose another solvent in which this substance dissolve. If we have a mixture of two substances like A and B, and each one gives two spots, so each one of them have two different substances. And if, a, if two spots having the same RF value, that means they are the same substance. Now let's go for the next slide. It's about fractional distillation. As we can see here, we have the liquid to be distilled and the condenser for cooling. As I said before, the lower opening is always for water inlet and the upper opening is always for water out. Here we have the liquid. It will be separated according to their boiling points. This liquid here is heated in an oil bath, not in a water bath, because we have one or more than one liquid in this mixture that have boiling point higher than the boiling point of water. In this case, we cannot use water pass as the, the temperature of the water pass will not rise above 100 until all water change into vapor. So we will use oil pass, which has higher boiling point in which this allow all the liquid to be distilled to evaporate, boil first and evaporate, condense it here according to their boiling points. So here you have to take care of these points. If we have one or more liquid in the mixture that have boiling point higher than the boiling point of water, we cannot use water pass and instead we will use an oil bath. Now we will shift to some techniques in salt preparation. The first method for salt preparation is titration. It is used to prepare soluble salt of group 1 metals or ammonium salt. Soluble salt of group 1 metal like sodium sulfate, lithium chloride or potassium nitrate. Ammonium salt is also like ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate because in these cases the alkali is a liquid and can be put in the purette. How to measure the volume on a purette scale? As I said before, the scale of the purette starts at the top by zero. But in the question, it will be written that some of the liquid has been run out from the purette. So the level of the purette will start with the initial reading. As we can see here, it's 8. After doing the titration, we will have another reading, which is the final reading. Here it's 17.9. So the volume of the liquid used from the purette will be the final reading minus the initial reading. Why we are using a white tile under the flask? Because the white color will make it easier and more clear to see the color change at the end point. We cannot use universal indicator in titration because the universal indicator has so many color change or wide range of color change, so we cannot easily see the color change at the end point. Here I have this table for the color change of phenolphthalene, methyl orange in acid, neutral and alkaline media. If you start putting the alkali in the flask, so the color, starting color of the indicator will be color in alkaline media. After titration, the final color of the indicator will be the color in neutral media. If you start putting acid in the flask, so the, fine, the initial color of the indicator will be the color in acid media. 
and the final color of the indicator will be the color in neutral media so as you can see always the final color of the indicator will be the color in the neutral media because at the end of titration we have salt solution and the salt is neutral so the final color will be always the color in neutral solution then another method for preparing soluble salts uh, is reacting metal or metal oxide metal hydroxide or metal carbonate with acid after filtering the excess solid we will have a solution contain the soluble salt so to obtain the salt we will make evaporation or crystallization evaporation if we want to obtain dry powder crystallization if we want to obtain hydrated crystal so if the question asks why we shouldn't overheat the crystal because if we overheat the crystal we will obtain dry powder instead of hydrated crystals then when doing crystallization how to know the crystallization point when we reach to a very concentrated solution we will dip a glass rod inside the solution get it out allow to cool we can see a few crystals very small crystals on the glass rod so this is the crystallization point we have to stop heating and allow the crystal to cool by cooling the solubility will decrease more crystals will form so we can filter out the crystals and dry them between two filter papers the third method is used to obtain insoluble salt the, this method is called precipitation we can mix two solution of soluble salt to obtain one insoluble salt this is the precipitation method here we mix two solution the first one lead nitrate which is all nitrate salts are soluble so this is an aqueous solution and we have sodium iodide which is of course soluble and we have another aqueous solution to prepare the insoluble salt lead iodide after we have the precipitate we will make filtration the lead iodide because it's insoluble will be here in the filter paper as a residue and sodium nitrate will be here in the filtrate solution this will be the filtrate contain sodium nitrate the question is why do we wash the residue with distilled water this question has two sides if they ask you the student want to prepare lead iodide so we wash the residue with distilled water to remove any soluble impurities and if he ask you that the student want to prepare sodium nitrate so we wash the crystal with distilled water to collect all sodium nitrate because it's soluble so it will be collected when we wash it with distilled water now we have uh, finished all the methods for salt preparation let's let's discuss the second question in paper six which is always about the rate of reaction one of the methods used for measuring the rate of reaction is reacting calcium carbonate or marble chaps with hydrochloric acid here we can measure the rate of reaction by measuring the decrease in mass of calcium carbonate by time or we can measure the rate of reaction by measuring the volume of carbon dioxide gas given off by time we may have questions like why does the mass decrease by time the mass decrease because we have carbon dioxide gas one of the products escape from the flask as the reaction is going on so escaping carbon dioxide causes the decrease in mass what is the function of the cotton wool actually the cotton wool has two function the first function is allows escape of carbon dioxide gas the second function is prevent the split or the lose of the acid using powdered calcium carbonate instead of lumps of course using powdered calcium carbonate this give a higher surface area allow the reaction to be faster so the reaction rate will be higher for the reaction rate when we are reacting metal with acid metal like magnesium with acid we always use excess metal to ensure all the acid have been reacted here to react the magnesium with hydrochloric acid we will remove the bung add a piece of magnesium or a piece of magnesium rub ribbon then closely uh, immediately close the bung and allow the reaction to happen and obtain the hydrogen gas here if the question asks you that you should choose another method instead of removing the bung adding magnesium ribbon then immediately close the bung again we can choose a divided flask that has a glass division inside the flask that separate hydrochloric acid from magnesium 
starting the reaction by swirling or tilting the flask so the reactant will mix up and the reaction can start it or we can put the magnesium ribbon in a small test tube inside the flask and again we can start the action by swirling the flax allow the reactant to mix here it, the reactant the the volume collected will be more accurate because we will not remove the bung so no gas will escape while removing and adding the bung again so the volume of the gas collected here will be more accurate and we can measure the reaction rate by measuring the volume of hydrogen gas collected against time here I have some curves that we could obtain in the question number two in paper six. As we can see here, the first curve is the volume of carbon dioxide gas collected when reacting marble chips with hydrochloric acid. The green curve will be for the larger marble chips and the black curve is for the smaller or the fine powder calcium carbonate. Of course, the smaller particle or the fine powder will have a larger rate or higher rate so the higher rate means the curve will be more steeper closer to the y-axis that will indicate higher rate of reaction but both curve will end at the same point the same volume of carbon dioxide because we are using the same volume same concentration of hydrochloric acid and the same mass of calcium carbonate second curve we can obtain it by changing temperature we are also measuring the volume of carbon dioxide again it's time but the second reaction which is the blue curve is done under higher temperature of course temperature higher temperature or increasing temperature will increase the rate of reaction so again the curve at the higher temperature will be more steeper more closer to the y-axis it will reach the plateau in less time but again we will have the same volume of carbon dioxide because we are using the same mass of calcium carbonate and the same concentration of the acid another curve should be obtained in question number three we have question number two in paper six sorry we have two curves when changing the concentration of the acid here the volume of carbon dioxide gas collected against time the red curve represent hydrochloric acid with half the concentration and the blue curve with hydrochloric acid double the concentration so the reaction will be higher rate with the hydrochloric acid of double concentration it is more steeper here we will find the volume of the gas collected different in, uh, in using different concentration of hydrochloric acid because we have magnesium in excess so allowing more hydrochloric acid to react the higher concentration will give higher volume of hydrogen gas but here in curve number four we will have different concentration of the hydrochloric acid but both curve will end up with the same volume of hydrogen gas because we are using the same mass of magnesium so magnesium is a limiting reagent after magnesium has finished no more hydrogen gas will produce and we will have the same volume for both concentration of the acid we're still in question number two in paper six he will ask you about sources of error in your experiment and how can you improve this error or correct this error the first source of error will be measuring the temperature uh, uh, temperature change in a reaction for if we measure the measure uh, the temperature change using thermometer you should use a polystyrene cup instead of beaker because polystyrene is insulator so this will minimize the heat loss second error if we use measuring cylinder to measure volume we can correct it or make it more accurate by using pipette or purette to measure the volume of the solution if he asks you how can we obtain more reliable results this can be done by repeating the experiment taking the average of more than one experiment here in this slide we will discuss uh, the technique of collecting and drying gases the first one is using gas syringe gas syringe is used when we want to collect and measure the volume of the gas given off in the reaction because gas syringe has scale so it can measure the volume another method using upward delivery or downward delivery upward delivery is used for gases which are less dense than air so it can be collected collected in the upper part of the inverted cylinder as we can see this method is used for 
example for hydrogen gas and ammonia gas. Downward delivery is used for gases which is more dense than air, so it can be collected in this way. It is used for chlorine, carbon dioxide, or hydrogen chloride gas. We can also collect the gas over water if we have gas which is insoluble or sparingly soluble in water, like ethene or oxygen gas. Here we have a very important note if the reaction involves heating, you should remove the delivery tube first before stop heating because if you stop heating first, the pressure inside the boiling tube will decrease and some of the water will be sucked back in the boiling tube and the boiling tube will crack. So here you have to remove the delivery tube first before stop heating. After collecting the gas, you will have to dry it. Drying the gases, we can use concentrated sulfuric acid to dry all gases except for ammonia because of course sulfuric acid will react with ammonia. Here this tube is used to enter the moist gas. It will dry with the sulfuric acid and get out here through this tube of the dry gas out. As you can see here, we have different positions or different lengths for the two tubes. The tube for the moist gas immerse it in sulfuric acid and the tube for the dry gas is shorter and not touch sulfuric acid. This is the correct position for the dry gas out tube because if it touches or immerse it in sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid will be pushed out with the gas through the tube and we cannot collect the gas separately. Another point is safety precaution during the experiment. If the question involves safety precaution, you can write wearing uh, gloves, goggles, or wearing the lab coat. And we can use fume cupboard if the reaction produces some toxic gases like sulfur dioxide gas or chlorine gas or bromine fume. Here I have another important note uh, for safety when we are heating mixture of alcohol. We can use electric heater instead of direct flame because uh, alcohol are flammable so this may catch fire if we use a direct flame. Here we reach to question number three in paper six when you have to analyze solid or solution to know unknown elements present in this solid or in the solution so we will show some appearance of the solids or solutions. You have to know that all metals are gray in color except copper is brown or you can say it's reddish brown of course gold is also uh, yellow brown but we will not use gold in our experiments copper oxide is black all copper salts are blue except copper carbonate is green in color all mineral acids and alkali are colorless solutions so if you have hcl or sulfuric acid or sodium potassium hydroxide they will be colorless solution hydrocarbons Hydrocarbons are oily colorless solution that are immiscible with water and they are burned with a smoky flame or sooty flame. Nitrogen dioxide gas is a brown gas that nitrogen dioxide gas may be produced in some reactions so you have to know the color is brown. Now we will start our analysis by testing for anions. The anion part is tested using a reagent he may give you the test and you should write the observation or vice versa you have to remember don't write any conclusion on the in the observation box you have to write only observation what you can see or what you can hear or what you can smell don't write any conclusion in the box for observation we have halides chloride bromide and iodide ions the reagent is silver nitrate and the colors of the precipitate formed white precipitate, creamy precipitate, yellow precipitate, respectively, in order. The white color will be silver chloride, the creamy color will be silver bromide, and the yellow color will be silver iodide. Testing carbonate should be done with any acid. We can see the effervescence of a colorless gas. Of course, this gas is carbon dioxide, so it can be tested with lime water. It will turn lime water milky or cloudy. Testing for sulfate anions can be done with barium chloride or barium nitrate. So it will form a white precipitate. This white precipitate is barium sulfate. So the reagent here either barium chloride or barium nitrate. Testing for sulfite ion 
using acidified solution of potassium manganate, the observation will be discoloration of the purple color or of potassium manganate, or we can say that the color change from purple to colorless. Testing for nitrate ions using sodium hydroxide, aluminum foil, and worm, the observation is a gas given off. This gas has abundant smell and it turns red litmus paper to blue color. This, of course, is ammonia gas. So if we heat sodium hydroxide aluminum foil with an anion, and the observation will be a gas that turns red litmus paper to blue, so the anion is nitrate. Here we have tests for gases. Ammonia gas has abundant smell. It turns red litmus paper into blue. We can test carbon dioxide gas, as we said, with lime water. It will turn cloudy or milky. Testing sulfur dioxide gas, it has also abundant smell and it is acidic smell. It will turn the solution or the filter paper soaked in potassium manganate from purple to colorless or discolorization of the purple color. Hydrogen gas, the test is lightest plant and the observation, it burns with a squeaky pop sound. The test for oxygen gas using a glowing splint and the observation that the splint relights. Then we will shift for the cation test. We can test cations using sodium hydroxide or ammonium hydroxide. Starting using sodium hydroxide, adding sodium hydroxide to the salt solution. If we have white precipitate, they may have zinc or aluminium or calcium ions. A very characteristic result for the calcium ion that the precipitate will not be soluble in the excess sodium hydroxide, so we can distinguish calcium ion. It, the only white precipitate that is not soluble in excess. The other two white precipitate for aluminium hydroxide, zinc hydroxide, they will be soluble in excess sodium hydroxide. If the precipitate is colored, we may have four different colors. The first one is blue precipitate like we said before all copper salts are blue and also copper hydroxide is blue so if we have a blue precipitate which is insoluble in excess so the cation is copper if the color is red brown precipitate which is insoluble in excess so the cation is iron plus three we can remember the red brown color because the red brown color is the color of rusted iron and iron plus three is the form of iron of the form of iron present in rust. <clears throat> we have a gray green precipitate. This will be soluble in excess sodium hydroxide to give green solution. Here the cation will be chromium iron. If we have a green precipitate, this will be iron plus two hydroxide and it will be insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide. So as we can notice here, the only precipitate that are soluble in excess sodium hydroxide are the amphoteric hydroxide. Chromium hydroxide, zinc hydroxide and aluminium hydroxide are amphoteric. So this three hydroxide will be soluble in sodium hydroxide. We can also use sodium hydroxide to test for ammonium salt as sodium hydroxide are stronger alkali than ammonium hydroxide, so it will displace ammonia from its salt, and we can smell the ammonia gas tested with red litmus paper. It will change into blue. We can also test for cations using ammonium hydroxide. In this case, we have three options, white precipitate, no precipitate, or colored precipitate. White precipitate, same like sodium hydroxide, we have zinc or aluminium hydroxide but the only difference here that only zinc hydroxide will be soluble in excess ammonium hydroxide if we have no precipitate it's again a characteristic result for the presence of calcium ions so if i have no precipitate with ammonia ammonium hydroxide the cation is calcium in the color precipitate we will have the same four colors of the colors formed with sodium hydroxide but the only difference here the gray green precipitate of chromium will not be soluble in excess ammonium hydroxide and instead the blue precipitate of copper hydroxide will soluble in excess ammonium hydroxide to give a deep blue solution soluble in the if the pre blue precipitate is soluble in excess sodium hydroxide to give deep blue solution this indicate the presence of 
cover ions. This is to summarize the cation test. We're still in question three in paper six. Now we have to do the flame test. To do the flame test, we will get platinum or nichronium wire, dip it in concentrated hydrochloric acid, then in the solution to be tested, then we will put the wire in the flame. We have two types of flame, luminous and non-luminous flame. To make the flame test, we should use the non-luminous flame, so the color of the non-luminous flame will not interfere with the flame test colors. So if the question asks which color, which type of the flame should be used, we should use the non-luminous flame to do the flame test. To obtain the non-luminous flame, we should move the cooler to get the air hole completely open. Now, a stream of, gas, of oxygen can flow through the flame and we have complete combustion that gives a very hot flame so we can use the non-luminous flame for heating. If you want to heat, we should use non-luminous flame and we have to keep the air hole completely open. This allows the flow of oxygen giving complete combustion so release high amount of heat. But for the luminous flame, the air hole will not be completely opened, so it will give incomplete combustion. That's why it produces soot that we can see the black color heat here, and the heat will not be very hot. It will be only moderately hot, and it burns quietly without noise, unlike the non-luminous flame, which give noise when burned. So what we should know here that we will use the non-luminous flame to make the flame test and we should keep the air hole completely opened due, uh, during using the non-luminous flame or during heating to give a very hot flame. Now we come to the fun part, the flame test. The cations have different colors with the flame. As we can see, sodium is a yellow color, potassium lilac color, calcium orange red color, lithium give red color with the flame, copper is a blue-green color, and finally barium is an apple green. I have a very old Chinese method to remember this color. First, give yourself a minute staring at this color. After staring for one minute, close your eyes, make sure that you can still see all the colors of the flame in front of, of your eyes while your eyes are completely closed. Now you can recall them whenever you want. In the exam, just close your eyes and you can recall all the colors. Now we have reached to the fourth and the last question in paper six, writing experiment or planning in an investigation. This question is for five or six marks. You have to follow these steps to get uh, the full mark in this question. First, writing all the steps, including all the tools that you have used in your experiment. Then you have to write all the variables that should be kept constant. For example, using the same mass of the solid or the same volume, the same concentration of the acid, doing the experiment at the same temperature. This all will give the condition for a fair test. You should also write the principle that you will use to measure your results. For example, recording the volume of a gas every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds, for example, recording the decrease in mass every 10 or 20 seconds, if the experiment contains comparison, you should also write the principle that you will use for your comparison. For example, if you have two metals, you have to write which one is a better catalyst. So which is the principle that you will use to compare between the two metals? Then you can give a final and general conclusion, like the metal will give the highest rate of reaction is the um, bitter catalyst. After that, you should write calculation. If the question contains calculation, write the formula needed for the calculation and the calculation that you use to reach your results. Uh, and you should also write equations if you have a reaction uh, or if the examiner asks you to write equations, if any. This is how can you get a full mark in this question. Well, this is all for now. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel to receive all the updates. Thank you for watching and see you soon.